morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Shemith Eliminator Stories. This morning, guys, you may recognize this uh, wonderful woman that I've got with me on the show this morning. Marianne Sinclair has been on a number of my shows, and I actually asked her to come back specifically to tell her story on the Shemith Eliminator, because what she has done over the last, you know, God knows how many years has been absolutely magnificent. And some of the things that she's doing right now you know, we as women often try to hold everything together, try to be the martyr of everything. And at times we find ourselves not always able to do that. And one of the things that she um, is very, very passionate about now is making sure that women take care of themselves. So I'm going to, we're going to take this conversation wherever it goes, because I know for Marianne right now, the fact that she is even with us today is, um, you know, a testament to her commitment to woman. So I want to say thank you very much for being here, uh, given, you know, our circumstances. We all have these different circumstances. And sometimes, guys, we know that, you know, what you sometimes see on the screen behind the curtain, behind the, you know, the walls, there's a lot of other stuff going on. And I know that, um, you know, that's not just, you know, me or Marianne, but that's a lot of you women out there who front up day after day, just, you know, step up, standing up, standing firm and trying to stand out also knowing that there's a lot of other things going on in your life so i want to commend her for being here today and i want to say thank you very much for doing all the things that you do we'll also give you guys a little bit of a um she might have some background noise going on so you know that's life we just carry on welcome marianne thank you tracy it's so good to be here with you again i love these conversations i just you know, anytime I can come and spend time with you and delve into conversations, I really love it because you are up to amazing things and especially this Eliminator story in the She Myth book. I just commend you with all you are doing to help women forward our place in the world. Oh, thank you so much. Well, look, let's start by giving everybody a bit of um, a bit of background to you and and some of the things that I suppose part of your journey and and maybe we'll delve into you know one or two instances where I know you know what a she myth is, so I'm going to ask you to sort of share a couple of instances where you've experienced that and what steps did you take to overcome those? Well, I have to clear the elephant in the room right now. So as you all can see, I am at the hospital um, and there's, I'm in like a family room kind of meeting room and there's people, nurses coming and going. So I just want to kind of put that out there so you kind of know what's going on and I'm not really rude and not having a bad background, but um, because of these wonderful platforms that we have in these wonderful day in society, we can be anywhere. And Tracy can be over in um, the down under and me in the USA. And, you know, we can have these amazing conversations. So um, my background is I'm the baby of the family as a woman. And um, I have two older siblings. And that's kind of where my journey begins as my parents got divorced when I was about six years old and they sat me down on um, a couch. I had a very pampered lifestyle before that, very white privilege, middle class, um, where I had a, a maid and yard men and just, I mean, we weren't super uber wealthy, but we, we had a nice life. And my parents sat me down on the couch and gave me a pen and paper and said, Marianne, you're going to have to take on these responsibilities and you're going to have to help out, you know, taking care of your older brother and sister. So right there was the beginning of my journey of taking care of everybody else. Right there, when I was five to six years old, I became a caregiver. <sighs> pretty that's pretty intense when you go to start thinking back on you know cooking and cleaning and and doing all those things and it progressed even to the point of you know i'm here in the hospital because um my daughter is ill and she's in the hospital and i needed to come 
and just give her a boost up, you know, give her, give her some energy, give her some life, give her some um, wonderful, you know, love, mama love. So that's kind of the beginning of the journey. Then I don't know, you want me to go from there? You want to pop in and let's talk about that for a minute and then I'll give them what yeah, I do and all that sort of thing. Let's talk about that. Let's, let's kind of delve a little bit deeper into, yeah. um, we want to go into, you know, being the youngest and kind of the responsibility that you had and obviously that then turning into, what well, that's kind of um, uh, molded me into this caregiving framework, so to speak, that then started to, create the, the trajectory of your life from there on. So let's talk a little bit about that and how that unfolded. It did. It did so much. So, you know, I can remember that I pretty much stopped playing a lot at that point and I became more serious and took on the roles of, you know, my mom was working and she was a stay at home mom before that, but she went off to work. So then there were a lot of responsibilities that I took on having, you know, dinner cooked and, you know, I'm just this little itty bitty thing and um, vacuuming and cleaning and doing the things because, you know, we were kind of on our own. Then my mom was, you know, at a point where she was just trying to make it. So, you know, it, it was a, it was a journey of, going from there, taking care of my older brother and sister and, you know, having dinner done for my mom, then rolling into my first relationship. And I carried on and marriage and um, then motherhood. And it just became this thing that it, I, it, I was always focused on everybody else's happiness mm -hmm. and not focused on my own happiness. You know, there were times, but not not that many times, not that many times to where I really was like, here's for instance, um, going to college. I wanted to go to photography college. I was only 16, graduated from high school, wanted, you know, got graduated early, buckled down, got good grades. And I wanted to go to college. And it was it was said to me that there wasn't money for me to go to college because one, I was the baby, two, I was a female and three, you know, it was just kind of like, you know, uh, it was, my dad had the mentality because he told my mom, you know, you aren't going to go to college. You just need to be a, a woman and stay home and take care of the house and everything. So she didn't go on and go to college, but she went, and, and raised us and then they got divorced. So she didn't follow her dreams. Mm -hmm. So I kind of took on that same pattern with my dad, you know, to where I didn't, there wasn't money for me to go to college. And he, he was retiring at that time and didn't want me to um, look in, didn't want to look into his finances and everything at that point. So there wasn't money for me to follow my dreams. And um, so I just kind of like, even when I was married, it was kind of like I listened to that same thing again from my husbands. I had two husbands. I'm married now, but I had a former husband. And it, it was, I gave up my power. I gave up my voice. I gave up my dreams, what I wanted to do, where I wanted to, you know, excel in the world. So that was kind of like how that progressed. And what's really unusual about that is that, you know, having the youngest, you know, mum coming in, mum and dad coming and saying, hey, Mary Ann, you're the little one here and you're going to have all of these responsibilities. Normally, that would be the eldest that would be given, hey, you've, you know, you've got to look after your younger brother and sister. And, uh, you know, those responsibilities would be given to, to them. And then at, at what point, Mary Ann, did you realise that as this was going on and you recognised, hang on a minute, this is a pattern. I've actually just jumped straight into my mother's shoes and I'm doing all the things that, you know, that she was doing and she wasn't really that happy. And actually, I'm not either. What was that moment like? What was the, the thing that, that was created that awareness? It wasn't until I hit burnout, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't until I went, 
you know, caregiver burnout. Um, even though I have been a coach for 20 something years, 26 years, um, it, it was a pattern of external validation, external, you know, uh, I, I didn't know to look within myself. I didn't know it was like to feel loved, to feel worthy, to feel all of those things were external. I was looking for validation outside of myself. And when I hit burnout, it was a, a key turning point where I set up boundaries, I had to heal myself, I began to look at what made me happy, where I wanted to, um, you know, change some of the stories that I was living. And I started really diving into another one that is back there was something my dad said, um, I love to travel, I love to go, I love to, I just traveled up to my mom's in North Georgia, and I traveled down to South Florida to where my daughter is. And I love trips and I love going. And my dad always had this thing with me that was, when are you going to settle down and stop running the roads? And I hope I never stop running the roads. And I hope I never stop because it, I have that, that, wondrous you know i have that i that newness of life and so i bought into you know i i i bought into it for a little bit it was a myth for me but i don't buy into it anymore i i i, I thrive traveling isn't it fascinating that you know and all of the conversations i've had have got to a point where people have said well you know i i had this awareness that something wasn't right you know I wasn't enjoying my life anymore this wasn't what I had planned for myself I wasn't following my dreams then having that moment then looking inwards and starting to work on themselves and then to kind of looking back you used to have these moments of I'm going to reflect back and think wow so all of those things like dad saying you know when are you going to settle down you know you should just shouldn't be traveling around like that um, I mean and I can I can absolutely resonate with that because my lifestyle particularly when I worked for uh, my previous organization you know an organization I moved almost every year so my children had many many schools and a lot of people would look at that as a you know as a negative thing whereas I I love that I love going and meeting new people and you know I've got friends everywhere because of that and that's the stuff that lights me up so you know those moments where we know inside of us that that's actually what we're born to do and it sounds a little cliche right that oh you're born to do that but when you know that's the things that light you up those are the things that bring you joy that you enjoy doing then you can start making a change yeah and start rewriting those stories like you know instead of um, being responsible for everybody else. It's like being responsible for my own happiness, being, yeah. you know, and, and, and really being responsible for my own happiness, you know, like only, only doing things because I choose to, not because I'm expected to, because I'm expected as a mother to do something, because I'm expected to take over, you know, raising my grandson because my daughter can't. You know, there, there's just, there's so many things that we, we get into patterns. And one for me that I started asking was, well, what about me? What about me? What about when is it going to be Marianne's time? When is it going to be my time to live my dreams, to feel happy, to feel, I'm going to slide this way, to feel joyful, you know, because it's, it's so often that we can get so caught up into living everybody else's dreams mm -hmm. and forgetting to check in on our own, to forgetting to check in on what makes us happy, what brings us joy, what makes us feel good. And I think if everybody starts asking those kinds of questions, mm -hmm. it's like magic will start 
blossom, you know, it, it will start opening. And it's almost like, you know, the, I could, the pivotal more, and I'm sorry, I'm moving, but one of the key things for me was when the sun is really bothering me. Um, there we go. Okay. The sun was killing me. <laughs> um, one of the key things when I was asking those times about what about me and, and, and focused externally. And when I shifted it, I became alive. And, and so I use that word because I think as women, we, one of the key things that we want is we want to feel loved and we want to feel alive. It's a very, um, some other people call it, you know, feel good or feel what, but it's an aliveness. And when we tune back into ourselves and our source and we can find that stillness and we can find that aliveness within us, it's just, now I can handle so much. I can sit here and be up at my mom's a few days ago with her with broken ribs and stuff. And I can be down here with my daughter. I can be on a call with you. I can be running my business and I can be, I stopped yesterday alongside of the road and did coaching calls. We can handle so much because our emotion, our leadership within us is not running on empty. It's running on full, you know, the gas tank is full. So that's, you know, that whole process of you sort of turning inwards and making sure that you're constantly focusing on you so that you're, you've got enough gas in the tank to continue to give. I love the way that you've been able to, you know, through this, these experiences that you've had, obviously you're very skilled in, in what you do too in terms of coaching and helping women to actually start, you know, thinking about themselves. And I love that whole um scenario where you said, you know, I started asking myself these questions. What about me? And and often we would think, well, that's, a, you know, you do hear the sheen of the yeah, that's selfish, you know, what about you? Well, what about you? Mm -hmm. you know, that, have you heard that before? Yeah, well, well what about you? What's got nothing, yeah. with, got nothing to do with you? And when we do that, when we start to, into, we start to focus on ourselves internally, we start to say, well, what about me? What are the things that make me feel alive? What are the things that bring me joy? And then you start doing those. You've got so much more to be able to continue to give. Because that, that whole, um, our, is ingrained in us is often that you never stop wanting to give, right? You never, it's not about saying, well, I'm not going to give anymore and it's just all about me. Because that doesn't ever go away. That's, that's no. part of the, the fabric of who you are, your DNA. And to mm -hmm. continue to be able to give, you have to have something to give. And if you keep like, you know, depleting the the stores on a regular basis and just keep handing out, but like a bank account, you keep handing out, handing out, handing out, you've got nothing back in there, very soon you're going to be, you know, broke and broken. Yes, yes. And and you know, one thing that um was so alive for me was that um, you know, some of the things, the roles that I was playing, the people pleaser, the, the person who, you know, wanted to give, 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 but there's, it's not from the standpoint of being, um, you know, I, not, not me first without everybody else, but it's, it's really, I have to fill up my cup. I have to make sure that I'm, the best that I can be and feeling like love. You hear a lot these days about self care and about loving ourself and loving ourself first and loving ourself. But it's really more than that. I, I, you know, as this feminine energy is rising and everything, I think it's way more than just loving ourself. I think it is, it's a place where you've got to come from love. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not another doingness. It's not, it's our beingness. Our embodied beingness is love. And when we can come from there and we can love 
just be love rather than love is something, an expression that I do. Um, I think it, it's just such a different place to start to begin because um, then you're not asking what about me because you are, you know, alive. You are love. You're not trying to find love out there because then you come from it. And the more you are that light, that are that expression, then you ha it just keeps flowing through. And it's, it's not like you have to go fill your cup up because you are full. I, I absolutely love that. I mean, one of the, the things that we are, we are doing, and I know you're doing it too in terms of like helping women rise and just ensuring that, you know, when you're coming from that place of love, you are love and just sharing that with everyone. I just uh, imagine a world where every single woman is actually doing that. Like if we all were coming from that place, that place of I'm just going to be pure love and just going to, to do whatever I can to feel that way myself then I can give that to everybody else everybody were doing that and we were actually helping each other rise what a wonderful place yes. this would be right because yeah. so often do we find that um you know I've had a number of conversations where we as women we want that to happen but then there are also at times women can often be the, the worst culprits and also pushing other women down. And then, you know, there's this awful um, culture where we have also had that kind of seep its, uh, I'm going to say ugly, you know, raise its ugly head in lots and lots of society. Yeah, well, I was, you know, watching one of your other lives the other day and, and then I just after that, I was kind of looking around. I mean, we as women tear each other down on what we look like, how we um, think somebody should, you know, the norms, if somebody is heavy, if somebody's, you know, not beautiful or, you know, there's just all these expressions that it's not even the point of, um, you know, like my mom didn't hold me down at going to college because she didn't get to go to college. She was like, you know, go to college, whatever, you know, you want to do. But what my mom did hold me back from was she would always say, you don't need to get pregnant again. You don't need to have another child. I only had one and I didn't have her until I was 30. And then I didn't have my second one until I was 40. And my mom was like, you don't need to have any more kids. You know, you, you don't need to have kids. And so I find myself saying that to my youngest one. So maybe I am, <laughs> maybe I need to revisit that. But I tell her, you don't need to have kids. <laughs> so yeah. This is the thing though, right? I mean, the more conversations you have like this and exactly like you've just experienced is, you know, nobody's perfect. And, and as much as we would love you know, all women to be perfect, come from pure love and do all the wonderful things. We're not always that. The reality is we're yeah. not. But if we can try and do that as often as we can, and as as you've just kind of had that moment of, oh, hang on a minute, well, that happened to me. That's what I, what I was hearing from my mum. I didn't really like that, but actually, oh, I've, that's what I've been saying to my daughter. It's, it's you know, we have, the, by telling these stories like that, is you have those epiphany moments of, oh, okay, maybe I need to reframe or, you know, change the narrative around that um, so that, that that feeling or that, you know, you kept that, you hung on to that, those words yeah. that your mother said and you hung on to them for a reason and now it's like the, the record replaying itself and now mm -hmm. you now realise, hmm, maybe I need to rewrite that record, that song this needs to be sung a little bit differently. So I, I love that these um, that these conversations are really almost telling our story, helping other women, but then also challenging ourselves to really think about, hmm, could I have done that a little bit differently? Could I come at that from a different angle? You know, am I really living my best life? And, you know, what the heck does that mean for Tracy Wilson or, you know, Mary Ann Sinclair? What does my best life actually yeah. look like? How do I start creating that? And I love the fact that you talked about it's a being, it's a sense of being that rather than, doing that because there's a vast difference and that's a lot more the feminine 
the beingness and being in our body and and not up in our heads you know trying to strategize and trying to do 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 and make stuff happen the the beingness of the feminine that we haven't really we're only beginning to just really surface this is the beingness it's being in our body and i think one of the first steps to that whole process is the awareness you know is slowing down it's becoming aware of these patterns that we're doing or why where is that coming from why am i doing that you know whose whose voice is that telling me that that's what i should be doing because me running the roads means oh my gosh it feels so good i get to go see somebody i get to go see something new i get to go on an adventure and you know that's what i tell my my grandson and that's what i told my kids is you know let's go on an adventure where are we going what are we doing and if life was lived like that if life was lived as your playground and it was just this adventure what would you be doing differently what was told to us that we needed to get married or have kids or what did life was supposed to look like? And then if it was lived as an adventure, what would we be doing? Good that. question, isn't it? It absolutely is. I mean, all the things, like a lot of what you've um, come to realize today has actually come or the journey that you've taken and to become the strong woman that you that you are now, very firm, have boundaries, you know, living, even though, even though there are things going on, you're still very grounded with who you are and what you're about. And that has all come about because you started asking yourself questions. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and when we start doing that, then you can start to make a change. It, it brings about awareness. So, so start asking yourself these questions as Marianne has uh, has done previously. And then eventually, you know, slowly but surely you can start taking action, start being the person that you want to be and then all of a sudden you'll start doing and having all of the things that that person yeah. who was being that does you know is just yeah, you have just to be it first just, they just have to that you just there's no other there's no other outcome because if you're being that you're going to have the things that you want so I want to say thank you very much for being here today Marianne I know that um you know you. you've got some you're you've been ex you're extremely busy I know that you're you know caring for your daughter right now and I want to send her send you and her lots of love and a big hug thank and before you. we go I want um, I want to ask you this I want to know if you were to sit down beside your younger self so if you were you know 10 or 15 years old and you had to give yourself a piece of advice what would that piece of advice have been one, the first and foremost thing that comes to my mind is be true to yourself. Sometimes that's go against the grain. Sometimes that means telling others no when so that you can tell yourself yes. Um, find ways to tell yourself yes more than yourself no. You know, to be able to tell others no, it might be the case. Um, and then I think... Really, it's live life as an adventure. It's it's say yes to yourself, live life as an adventure, and really tune in to your body. You know, the, the body has so much wisdom and we live from here up. And if you could really start feeling and, and tapping into your emotions and your feeling senses and living more in that state, that capacity. Um, I, I think, you know, you need to bring your body with you rather than leaving it behind and taking an aspirin or numbing it because, you know, we, we need to um, find ways to cope in the world. I think it's no, it's like bring all of your messiness, your sassiness, your, your electricity, your weirdness, your bring all that with you and be and live fully alive 
thank you so much. What a great message to end today's conversation with. Like I said, I'm sending you a big hug and lots of love. And I know that the rest of you. the viewers and listeners will be doing exactly the same. Um, we're, you know, we will keep in touch and uh, I will continue to follow your journey because I'm absolutely loving what you're up to. But before we go, I want you to also just um, tell us what is the mission that you are, you are creating now. Give us the name of that mission and what it is that you're, you're up to. So I have a mission about, um, and I'm tweaking it a little because I'm getting a little pushback on the Me First movement. And the Me First movement was not intended to be me and nobody else. It's really to say, you know, let's let's look at what are the things that we're, we're not living true to our authenticity, to where we're, you know, not being true to ourselves. And so um, it is still, I, I'm so passionate about having women to begin to tune into themselves and resurface what brings them pleasure and play. And then the other part is embodied leadership. It's really helping everybody to, to come back home into their bodies, whether or not it's men or women, really to begin to um, have your emotions be um, to where you can up your levels of leadership and whether or not that's in your family and how you're, who, you know, how you're parenting, um, how you're being with yourself, how you're being with, you know, your, in your business, it all to, taps into and it really is um, such a gift for us to live from this place of embodied leadership. I love it. Well, thank you so much for being here. We're going to uh, we're going to let everybody know where they can get a copy of the Shemith book. So those of you who have been watching, you know where to go and get it now. But if you'd like a copy of the Shemith book, then you need to go to Amazon.com or Amazon.com today, you if you're in Australia, and uh, get yourself either a paperback, hardback, and it's also available on Kindle as an ebook version as well. Go get your hands on that book. And if they'd like to get a hold of me, I'm MarianneStClair.com, Marianne St. Clair on all the social media platforms, and you can find me on Clubhouse. So um, lots to share about embodied leadership. Thank you so much, Tracy. Uh, you do not know how many times I am referring your book out because I just, because it's, you know, we all need to really take a look at what myths we are living, you know, from. And so I thank you for this gift that you and Vicki have brought forth to the world because it's, it needs to be just like preferred reading and families and stuff. Well, thank you so much. It's, um, I, I'm, that, that's fantastic that you are sharing it with other, with others and Vicky and I are both humbled that it's been accepted so you know well and people are are doing that are sharing I had somebody actually message me or come uh, and caught up with me the other day and she said every night she's sitting down and reading a chapter of this to her granddaughters who are currently mm -hmm. only you know six and seven years old and they talk about the she myths so that the, as she said so my granddaughters can see when they're being she myth they can understand when these things are going on and they know what to do if that's the case because i want them to grow up as strong you know uh strong confident young woman so i'm yes. it was like wow that is so amazing that you know grandmothers are seeing it fit to actually spend the time and take their little ones through uh through the book too so thank you so much for being here. I'm going to say bye for now. Everybody who's watching today, thank you very much for tuning in. I'm hoping that you're enjoying these Shemith Eliminator stories. They are absolutely amazing. And I've been loving hearing what these empowering, inspirational women are doing and what they have done to get to the point that they're at today. And I know that there are many of you out there, and you know who I'm talking to, if you're watching this, you also have a story inside of you. And I want to invite you to get in contact with me so I can allow your story to be also be heard and shared through this network. Because once you share your story, you will be helping, you know, even if you help only one other woman, that it is an amazing thing that you're able to do by sharing your your gift and your story to make this world a better place. So thank you and bye for now.